Tonight, believe it or not, I have a review for the first Christmas movie of the season. And an old segment that was quite popular is making its return. But before we get underway, let's talk a little bit about Black Adam. Now, I'm about to say something that is probably very controversial. And that is that I like DC superhero movies much better than Marvel superhero movies. The reason is, I understand you're dealing with comic books, but the DC movies tend to be a bit more cerebral, while the Marvel universe tends to be a bit more juvenile. People in the studio are wailing and gnashing their teeth. Black Adam is a DC superhero movie that plays like a Marvel movie. You know, there's a lot of confusion over this character of Black Adam, and I must admit, until the movie came around, I hadn't read anything about him at all. If you read this guy in the comics, this is a nasty dude. He is not fun, but that does not fit into the persona of Dwayne The Rock Johnson, so he's altered considerably in this movie so that he can yeah, switch sides, kind of like what Will Smith did in The Suicide Squad. Pierce Brosnan is in this movie. He plays a, a, boy, a character I never heard of and is, is really useless called Dr. Fate, but I have to tell you that he steals the movie. He, the scenes he's in, he just commands the presence. And even though his character is, I don't know, maybe a D-level superhero character, he outshines everyone else in this movie. Now, the best part of this movie is a surprise ending. And I'll tell you about that right after we take a little look at Black Adam. This loose cannon needs to be locked down before innocent people start getting hurt. He's been asleep for 5,000 years. If you find us a cell that can hold him, we'll take care of the rest. Who's on the team? I didn't bring a passport. We don't need passports. We're here the Justice Society. There's a war going on outside. We ain't safe from it. Black Adam. We're here to negotiate your peaceful surrender. Heard about at least three killers this afternoon. I'm not peaceful. Nor do I surrender. Here we go. I kneel before no one. You didn't come here to seek justice. You came to exact revenge. I never said I was a hero. Giving you respect, I expect the same thing. You believe you are not worthy. But fate does not make mistakes. I'll fight for you. This is war going on outside when we ain't safe from. You have two paths. You can be the destroyer of this world. Or you can be its savior. As I said, the best part of this movie is the little uh, surprise ending there where we see Henry Cavill back as Superman. And it is official. He will appear as Superman in the DC storylines and in another Man of Steel uh, movie along. This has caused a little bit of controversy because the DC shooting schedule is such that it may put Cavill's starring as Geralt, the White Wolf Witcher, for the Netflix series in jeopardy, and it may interfere with his selection to be the next James Bond. I will have a whole lot more to say about that on the next show. But for now, Cinematic Class is about to begin. Your professor is in.
Greetings, salutations, another sundry affair. I am your cinematic professor and a purveyor of truth in movies. And I got to tell you that before we get underway, we want to say a special tip of the hat to our sponsor, House of Feruza Barbershop and Cigar Lounge. We have a big sale coming up. And I'll give you some details about that a little later on in the show. Hey, I teased you and I said I had the very first Christmas movie. This one is released already. And I, well, I guess once Halloween is over, you, you turn toward, everybody hops, skip, and jumps over Thanksgiving. And, and here we go with Christmas. And I have to tell you that when I watch this, anybody who was walking by my house uh, would probably have been tempted to phone in uh, to the loony bin to come and rescue me. I, <laughs> I was by myself in the house, and I was cackling hysterically, all because of the season's first Christmas movie called The Killing Tree. Okay. This is an epic slapstick romp comedy, and I got to tell you, it's from the folks at Uncorked, and of course, Scott Jeffrey is involved in this. It seems I mention him every show. So now, officially, he has done 31 movies in three years. Now, this really does begin as a horror tale. You see, there's a couple who are serial killers. And every Christmas, they go out and claim 12 victims for the 12 days of Christmas. But last year, there was a miss-up, and the husband is killed. So the wife decides to use black magic to bring him back in time for this holiday season so they can reprise their murdering spree. While she's doing the ceremony, something goes terribly wrong. And her murderous husband returns as a Christmas tree. Honest to God. Light bulbs, garland, tinsel, star at top, the whole nine yards. Uh, this tree decides to go after the surviving victim of last year's mishap. And she just happens to be holding a Christmas party that evening. So the tree is killing all of her guests with garland and light bulb strands and Pointy branches. Uh, it's actually epic to watch this Christmas tree bounce through the forest. This thing had me laughing out loud. It's just so ridiculous. And, and, I don't want to give the ending away, but let me tell you that you're in for a treat as there is a epic battle of Christmas trees. <laughs> it's... Jeffries is with his buddy Reese Frake Waterfill. These two are working together, and they're also working with director of photography Vince Knight. Those trios uh, have been in the last few movies that I've done together. Sarah Marks, Judy Chinernak, Sarah Cohen, Marcus Massey stars. Massey, by the way, is the tree, so I got to give special kudos to him. This thing is a riot. Here's a look at The Killing. Tree. My dear, we cannot rest until our work is complete. That one will pay for what she did to you. Because this is your Christmas party, how about we get you a drink? And then the real party can start. Tonight, I bring you back. I know it's early in the show, but it's time to give something away. And uh, our folks from uh, Wellgo USA are back at it again. You know, I believe it was, oh, I want to say maybe a 
couple of years ago. I did a review on a movie called The Witch, and now what I'm presenting to you is The Witch. Now, before you get all excited, this is not another horror movie. If you recall the original movie, which was a, an acronym, and I can't recall offhand what it stands for, but basically it was a government program to make the ultimate warrior fighting machine by using people who had uh, extrasensory sensory mental powers, okay, and they were going to turn these people into, uh, into uh, the super agents, super weapons, super soldiers, whatever, okay? Well, the first one ended with, uh, with a little bit of a tag, you know, there's, there's another one out there, and now she's back, okay? And she's in this one. Uh, I got to tell you, this movie does not stop. I, well, it takes about 10 minutes, <laughs> okay, to set up the plot. And then the other two hours, this thing is just rolling. I mean, the body count is massive. Uh, there's all kind of action going on in this, incredible stunts. Uh, and of course, you know, magical powers, you can do things that, you know, normally wouldn't happen. So this thing gets to be an awful lot of fun. And you can add this to your home video collection simply by sending me your name and address to filmcritic3 at verizon.net. And I got to tell you, once again, I only have a limited number of these. So once they're gone, they're gone. Send me your name and address today, and I'll fire one of these off in the mail to you. That's all you have to do. This is the deluxe Blu-ray edition with all of the extras on the back. Why don't we take a look now at which two the other one? If you like an awful lot of action in your movie, this one is for you. Add it to your collection. Send me your name and return address and I will fire this out to you. Film Critic 3 at Verizon.net. The Witch 2 can be on your way. Hey, I want to go back to the, to the teaser intro for just a minute. You remember this guy? <laughs> this is Hawkman, all right? This is the way I remember Hawkman. He's not that way in the movie anymore. They've, they've gone PC. They've turned him black. He looks like he's some kind of Viking in this one. And... Uh, he doesn't have wings. He has like mechanical wings and stuff. So that's a little aside for you when you when you go to watch Black Adam for the first or second time coming around. Say, you know, Danny Elfman has really made a name for himself in Hollywood. He was uh, a member of Oingo Boingo. And uh, that band was, uh, well, they had like a cult following. I don't think they ever reached any uh, great heights. Were you a big fan of Oingo Boingo? A little bit? Yeah, okay. Well, see, Dave liked them. But in any event, I think he became a lot more popular once he broke off from the band and started doing movie themes. So, what do you do if you're Danny Elfman's daughter? You make movies. <laughs> yeah, you don't go in the rock, you make movies. And that's exactly what Mari Elfman has done. She wrote and directed our next review, which is a movie called Next Exit. Now, basically... This is a road picture, but without the comedy. Remember, road pictures, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, that type of thing. Rather, instead of comedy, we have insipid life platitudes that Jimmy Stewart discovered decades ago when he did It's a Wonderful Life. Spurred by video footage of a little boy playing cards with his dead father, Dr. Stevenson, who was played by Karen Gillan, begins a study called Life Beyond. It's assisted suicide is what it is, but it has the added element of monitoring the progression of the person to the afterlife as a method of learning what lies beyond. Now, Rose, who is played by Katie Parker, is a complete mess. She's the type of girl who, once you meet her, you need to be as far away from her as possible. 
Through circumstances, she joins Teddy, who was played by Rahal Kohli. They go on a cross-country trip together to San Francisco to become volunteers in Dr. Stevenson's experiment. And along the journey, they meet a selection of characters who shine a, a bright light on aspects of their lives, aspects they did not appreciate. You know, it's not a bad offering from Mari, but it is unquestionably a tale that women will appreciate a lot more than men. And it's also a good 20 minutes too long, and for that, we will blame editor Brett Bachman. Shame on you. Here's a look at Next Exit. I'm taking a trip. Where are you going? It's difficult to say. So this is supposed to be goodbye? No, I'll, I'll come back and haunt you. <laughs> are you two together? She should be so lucky. When's your appointment? Seven days. Mine's in five. You serial killer? Yeah, no. 6 a.m. the car leaves. Sharp. Razor. We're not pals. We're not in this together, okay? How many people know what it's like to be us right now? At our institute, we now bridge dozens of new participants daily from this world to the next. Once you're in a state of passing, we terminate your physical form. In three, two, one. Wait. I see it. This darkness. It's irresistible. Well, I told you at the beginning of the show that a... Uh, a new segment was coming back. Well, it's not really a new segment. It's an old segment that I used to do, and a lot of people liked it. And I think given what's happening now in Hollywood and Tinseltown, it's time to bring it back. So without any further ado, we are restarting the biz buzz. You know, Tinseltown is determined to brainwash everybody by inundating them with alternative lifestyles. It's an insidious agenda of moral signaling. And give you an idea of what's going on here, Kenya Barris is producing a reboot of The Wizard of Oz. He is proudly boasting that his movie will feature LGBTQ characters and storylines. He's hoping it will endure as long as the Judy Garland original. Good luck with that. Jared Carmichael is fresh off his performance in the HBO Max special Rothaniel. He has revealed that he is queer and he wants to serve as a role model for any of you parents whose children may want to switch to the other side. He'll work with them. I think that's most noble. Laverne Cox will star as a trans woman in Clean Slate. And this is going to be done for Amazon. The story takes place in the South. So Laverne is bragging that the show will not only highlight trans trauma, but it will also shine a spotlight on the prejudice of the South. And this just came in before we began shooting. Beginning on December the 1st, uh, Diva Box Office TV, that's the name of it, will be the first streaming network for the Alphabet people. It's a um, collaborative effort between Tello Films, which is uh, renowned for being an exclusive lesbian film production company, and Diva Magazine, which is quite popular in the UK. It's a British lesbian publication. The new streaming network will feature original films and series, as well as vintage Tello productions. All will highlight alternative and trans lifestyles, and it's making its way here to America, as I said, on December the first. The streamer's first production will be a Christmas movie called Merry and Gay. Here's a look. You are a Broadway star. I'm a small town bar owner. I bet you she didn't even tell you about the offers from Hollywood. We're just on different paths. I came back here to be with you. We only have one month to convince them that they are perfect for each other. Okay, so there it is. And this brings us to a story that I promised you on the last show. 
The LGBTQ folks in Tinseltown are demanding that their viewpoints be included in Christmas productions. If you don't do this, you guessed it, you're a racist. Okay, But the LGBTQ agenda is actually being countered in a rather epic battle in Tinseltown by the Great American Family Channel. Now that promises to promote traditional American family values and traditional Christmas themes in its programming. One of the motivating forces behind the channel is Candace Cameron Bure. Now she is best known for her part in Full House and a myriad films that she made when she was with the Hallmark Channel. So what has happened here is the Great uh, American, the Great American Family Channel has absorbed or taken over what used to run in on the on the um, Hallmark Channel. Now, <laughs> here it comes, shameless plug. <laughs> As you know, good old Candace is married to Valerie Bure, and Valerie Bure is the brother, he's an NHL hockey player, former, and he is the brother of Pavel Bure, who was probably one of the best forwards the Vancouver Canucks have ever seen, and uh, the only thing that stopped him from winning a Stanley Cup was Mike Richter, all the way back, I think, in 1994. Now, why do I mention that and bring that all up? It's to tell you that In the Crease is back and on BPTV once again. And this is something, you know, I've gotten a lot of comments already from our first episode, and uh, we're taping this show now. David and I are going to be back here in the studio with Bob in about five more days. We'll be doing a second episode. So it's nice to have everybody back. And we made that little tie there with the Bure. So you got that, you got that in there. All right. So that's what's going on. The big battle now between this, this, uh, this brand new streaming service and the Great American uh, Family Channel. And uh, they are going at it rather tooth and Oh, and by the way, that Lori Lachlan is, is also helping Candace with this. Remember her from the Hallmark Channel and all that? Yeah, and she's a convicted felon. You know, remember the, the college tuition scandal? Yeah, she actually served time for that and got caught on it. Yeah, so you've got a, a convicted felon coming back and uh, fighting for traditional family values. I, I think this whole thing is kind of interesting. Bottom line is, if you're into whatever programming, you simply watch what is being offered. And if you're not into it, don't turn it on because the bottom line is money will determine what stays and what doesn't. It's really that simple. We need to take a break. I've got a lot more for you when Outtakes with Rex Reel continues right after this. For quite some time now, I've been telling you about the wonderfulness of the House of Feruza Barbershop and Cigar Lounge. Men, you could look your best when you go in there, see Sam or Corey, and come out styling and profiling. But the big thing coming up now is Sam's annual cigar sale from the Cigar Lounge. You know, it's, in case you're looking for Christmas gifts, this is my favorite. This is the Monte Cristo, and this is the number two Monte Cristo. They have a tighter, compact version of it. This is the number three Monte Cristo. Either way, you can't go wrong. They smoke incredibly fine. And when you see the deals that Sam is working out on his cigars, they're creating a walk-in humidor, which is literally going to have hundreds of different cigars on display. You could just walk in and pick whatever you want. This thing is really... You won't go there and have a bad time. I guarantee that. It's the House of Feruza Barbershop and Cigar Lounge located at the corner of South Park Road and Drake Road. They support us, won't you support them? Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to leave you on a, uh, on a, on a happy note, if you will. <laughs> Remember the movie Willow? Val Kilmer, that was some time ago, and I originally thought that movie was rather mundane, insipid, if you will. But now Disney owns Lucas Films, and that was a George Lucas production, so it has turned Willow into a streaming series. Warwick Davis returns as Willow, who is now old, but he's actually a strong sorcerer. Erin Kellyman is Jade. She's our biracial woman warrior. 
Ruby Cruz is Kit, the wannabe woman warrior, and Amir Chada Patel is Borman. He's the male warrior who actually ends up saving all of the women warriors. And finally, Tony Revolori is the epitome of the modern-day girly man in this. He is the foil and the comic relief. He's kind of a wuss in this movie. Or series. The TV show features all of the Disney mantras and agendas, but they are mixed with modern mores, so it's actually rather humorous, kind of like what Kevin Sorbo did when he did Hercules. It's like that, yeah, so it washes down pretty well. Jonathan Kazdan is the chief force for this series behind the camera. Even though a Disney agenda permeates the show, I gotta tell you, I rather enjoyed watching this one. I wasn't a fan of the original film, but this series is very well produced, thanks to Kazdan, and uh, it's, worth, it's worth looking at. Here's a look. You think you know what is real and what isn't. What is light? What is dark? Now, forget all you know. Come with me. Willow. We're looking for the sorcerer, Willow. I was told that once long ago you defeated the forces of evil. You remind me of your mother. My dear friend, I thought I could prevent all this. I was wrong. My brother was abducted. The world needs you again. It needs your magic. Follow me. We must go beyond the edge of our world into the unknown. Willow! I need your help. Just like old times. Running! Horses! Damn! Damn! I pick a sea at me. Our true enemy is still out there. Rallying the forces of evil. And the only thing standing in its path is us. I'm going to enjoy this. If you think you're what I'm thinking, so am I. I doubt that very much. Take him to my tent and make sure he's tied up. I don't know. See, that kind of sounds like we're on the same page. When I was a kid, I used to play at being a sorcerer. Visiting strange worlds, fighting monsters. Run! Never thought I'd actually really do it. What the hell is that? Oh. Trolls. I'm so miffed. We have to hurry. How will you defeat us? Same as last time. With my friends. Say, I would love to talk more movies with you, but we are fresh out of time for this episode. I've got a lot more on the next episode, including another installment of the Biz Buzz. So now that you have learned what you have learned, Horrendous, your lesson.